let's go to the next slide, 31. Here's a, a modern version of this, which is lipodystrophy in HIV-infected patients. And these patients, um, this is apparently caused by the antiretroviral therapy that they go on. And you can see in the upper photo, you get the same loss of subcutaneous fat in the face. And then you get um, uh, fat added elsewhere. They buffalo hump on the back, breasts grow. Um, you get this pot belly, actually the, the, the butt shrinks and you lose the fat on the butt and the legs. And the photo on the bottom is a visceral fat accumulation before antiretroviral therapy and then on the right is four months later after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. And if you imagine the patient on the right goes in to see the physician and the physician doesn't know about the history, doesn't know about AIDS, doesn't know about the antiretroviral therapy, he's going to take one look at him and he's going to say, look, you've got to go to the gym eat less, exercise more. And yet we know from the photo on the left that this person did not have a problem with whether or not he was going to the gym and eating too much. We know that something the drugs did made them lose fat in some places, gain it in others, and it almost assuredly had nothing to do with how much they ate or exercised. So now let's go to the physics. Why do we believe this? Skip ahead to slide 33. Where did this overeating hypothesis come from? And it comes from the laws of thermodynamics, obviously. Um, first law of thermodynamics, often people like me who argue that calories are kind of irrelevant in obesity are accused of um, ignoring thermodynamics or not believing in thermodynamics. Atkins was always attacked for trying to argue that thermodynamics somehow doesn't hold for obesity. And what the law of thermodynamics does, the energy conservation law says that the change of energy expenditure, that's delta E on the left, is basically is equal to the energy we, we um, consume, E in, minus the energy we expend. All this law says, it's a law of energy conservation, and it says if, some, if a system gets more massive or less massive, it has to take in either more energy than it expends or less energy than it expends because you can't create energy from whole cloth. And that's all this law says. And what the community has done since the Second World War, since the Stella von Norden in 1903, is they've taken this equation, delta E equals E and minus E out. Change in fat mass equals energy consumed minus energy expended. And they've said to themselves, if we increase energy consumption, we increase E in, and we keep energy expenditure the same, then the fat mass has to go up. Therefore, eating too much, consuming too much energy, is a cause of obesity. And then they say if we decrease energy expenditure and we keep energy consumption the same, fat mass has to go up. Therefore, sedentary behavior is a cause of obesity. And the problem with that thinking is fundamentally this. This equation has no causality in it. And that thinking is putting a causality where it doesn't exist. This equation merely says if a system gets bigger, it's got to take in more energy than it expends. But it says nothing about why that happens. And a metaphor that I'm now using, and maybe you guys can tell me whether this works or not, but I equate this to imagine if, you know, you're, you're in a... a lecture hall, and hearing me in person, the lecture hall is crowded, so it's full of energy. You know, two hours ago it was empty, now it's crowded, it's full of energy, and people have energy just like fat mass have energy, and you want to know, why did that person get fatter? Why did that room get crowded? Why did delta E in this lecture hall go up? And you ask me, why did this room get crowded? And I say, well, because it took in more people than it let out. That's what you're saying when you say somebody got fatter because they took in more energy than they expended. Now, in the lecture hall idea, if I said that to you, you'd say, well, of course it took in more people than left. That's obvious. But why did it take in more people than it left? And I say to you, well, look, if a lecture hall takes in more people than it lets out, it's got to get more crowded, right? And that's the equivalent of saying if somebody eats more than they expend, they have to get fatter. But I still haven't told you anything. I've told you absolutely no causal information. And in the lecture hall analogy, you'd be saying to me, well, what are you, some kind of smartass or an idiot? 
But if we say that about fat, and it's said every day, said by some of the smartest scientists in and out of the field, by presidents and their wives, if somebody takes in more energy than they expend, they get fatter. Therefore, taking in more energy than they expend causes obesity. And it's nonsensical because it doesn't tell us why they took in more energy than they expended. There's no causality there. It just says if somebody takes in more energy, then they have to get fatter, or if they get fatter, rather, then they have to take in more energy than they expend. This is how it was explained. Go to the next slide, 34. Um, Jean Mayer, uh, famous nutritionist who did a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. In 1954, he said, obesity, too many people believe, is explained by overeating. Actually, it should be recognized as simply restating the problem in a different way and reaffirming somewhat unnecessarily one's faith in the first law of thermodynamics. To explain obesity by overeating eating is as illuminating a statement as an explanation of alcoholism by chronic overdrinking. It's like blaming chronic fatigue syndrome on somebody not having enough energy. You take something that has to happen if somebody gets fatter, and you say that's the cause. And by doing so, well, there are a lot of things that happen by doing so. We won't get into it. So here's the second problem, and this is actually the fundamental insight in the field. When you tell someone, go to slide 35, that they can lose weight by eating less or exercising more, you're assuming that EN, consumption, and E-out expenditure are independent variables, okay? What that means is you're assuming, and you see this written all the time, somebody can eat 200 calories a day less, or if I can you put you on a diet and you'll eat 500 calories a day less and you keep it up for a week, you'll lose a pound a week, and a pound a week you'll lose 20 pounds in 20 weeks. And the assumption is that energy expenditure will stay the same if you decrease consumption. And if you tell somebody to exercise to lose weight, the assumption is that you can increase expenditure and their consumption won't change. And the second one is obvious because actually prior to the 19... 70s, 1980s, there used to be this concept of working up an appetite. It used to be believed that if you increase your expenditure, if you went for a hike, you went for um, uh, played 18 holes of golf or two sets of tennis or had a, you know, even went dancing all night long, you got hungry. You know, matter of fact, back in the 60s, people used to tell, you know, people to, that they, if they should eat more, if they were too thin, they'd go, you know, go play 18 holes of golf, work up an appetite. This is what my mother believed. This is what I believed. Um, what happens if you expend more energy is you increase consumption. You can show this in animal studies. And if you can increase the consumption, you actually decrease expenditure at times when people aren't exercising. And if you decrease intake, you actually decrease expenditure. Not just this impulse to work out, that body temperature will go down, metabolism will slow. And in Scientific American in 2007, Jeff Flyer, who's now dean of Harvard Medical School, and his wife, Terry Maritos Flyer, they're both obesity experts, they put it this way, and they were talking about animals. But they said an animal whose food is suddenly restricted tends to reduce its energy expenditure, both by being less active and by slowing energy use in cells, thereby limiting weight loss. So if you give an animal less food, not only does it become sedentary, but it actually uses up less energy, its metabolism slows down, its temperature slows down, it also experiences increased hunger so that once restriction ends, it'll eat more than its prior norm until the earlier weight is attained. And likewise, after intentional overfeeding, an animal will start to expend more energy and exhibit reduced appetite. So if you increase intake, expenditure will go up. And if you decrease intake, expenditure will go down. E in and E out are independent variables. And the question is, what we want to know is why. What's going on here? Why is it that these are linked? I mean, we know actually your body is trying to conserve delta E, but that's, um, we'll get to that shortly. So let's look now at the alternative hypothesis. The energy balance hypothesis is actually nonsense. Saying that we get fat because we eat, we take in more calories than we expend doesn't tell us anything about why we take in more calories than we expend. So let's look at a hypothesis that might, and this is how the Europeans looked at it prior to the Second World War. And they said obesity, the first thing they said was obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation. It's first principles. Today you read obesity is sort of energy balance. It's not. It's not overeating. It's not sedentary behavior. Start from the principle obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation. <laughs>